So thank you, Damith, Caroline, Thomas, uh, for uh, everyone for putting this together. I really am grateful to be invited. And I want to talk today about uh, something that has evolved in the course of our experience over the past year and a half. And that is um, this, this pandemic that came out of the blue and has dramatically changed our, our lives. It, it, I don't think we'll fully understand the effect of this for, 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 for many years into the future, but I've been, I've been trying to think about how it, it, it affects us and how it inter may intersect the, the issues of, of art and, and, and social and our, our experience with culture. One thing that happened was it triggered a major reawakening of, of issues around diversity, inclusion, equity, and that I think is a is a is an extremely valuable outcome, very positive outcome. I think this is creating changes all over the world, and I I am very hopeful that this will not this will continue into the long into the future that this was a this is a real wake up call for many people and it, it affected many different groups that were marginalized have been marginalized in the past and have there's a new appreciation a new a new awakening into the issues of 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 exclusion and 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 I think a new reconsideration of of who we consider other in our world. We obviously in the US had a, we've been essentially dealing with a, a, with a long nightmare um, that we woke up from. And I think the virus, at least in the United States, was the, the, the only way that we would have seen a transition in our leadership. And I'm thankful for that. And in the context of artificial intelligence and robotics, I've been thinking about where, where does this intersect, the, the topics we're talking about today. And I want to um, show you some works, but actually going back to the the historically uh, some of the context for for art and robots. And I'm just going to start with this piece by Madeline Gannon, who many of you are aware of that she exhibited this in and in, in this has been exhibited actually in a number of different locations. It's a beautiful work that um, that uses industrial robots, but in a very, um, well, you might say emotional or affected, effective way. Uh, I think it's, it's very relevant to the wonderful title of this workshop, The Sentimental Machines. And I really like it because it, there's, a, there's a sort of poignance to the movements and the interaction that, the, that visitors have with these industrial robot arms. But this idea, let's go back for, for, for a moment to the early history that the idea of artificial beings, um, AI, if you will, really has, a, has this rich history. And in the West, it begins with Pygmalion and may go back further. Um, but Pygmalion is the classic tale of the, of the artist who creates a statue and falls in love with it as, and it becomes more, more alive than, than real life. And it's a cautionary tale, as you know. And then fast forwarding up through the Golem of Prague, which you also are familiar with as a, a story about a, a, an artificial being that's created to, to fight anti-Semitism and is, is then that, I won't spoil the ending, but it's a great tale also about an artificial being. And then in the, um, in the Renaissance, we have Da Vinci and Volcanson up through this this period of the, run, the the into the Enlightenment, this fascination with automata and machines, and of course, Descartes writes about automata and the meditations, and how that helps him understand what is what it is to to be to exist in terms of cognition. And I'm also want to mention the Mechanical Turk. This is a wonderful element in the history of art and robots because 
this it speaks volumes really about about our perception and expectations. The Mechanical Turk was was developed in in uh, in Czechoslovakia uh, and then toured all over Europe and the United States. I don't know if it make it made it to uh, Australia, but it was um, a remarkable story and it would win. It was a very extremely um, competent um, player of chess and it was a marvel. Um, and for many years, no one discovered the um, was was aware of the the secret. It was a it was a very clever magic trick, and it was a, a small um, very uh, a, a small person who was actually quite skilled at chess. In fact, it wasn't just one person. Many people played this role. Now, and right around the same time, we have this E. T. A. Hoffman tale that comes out, the Sandman, and it's it's a really interesting Gothic tale. 1816 of, of a boy who falls in love with a with a robot an android and it's set in a very complex context of of sort of childhood fears of um of of this m evil magician stealing a boy's eyeballs for his creations and then the boy falls in love with one of these creations not knowing, not being sure that it's a it's a it's a little girl or a or a robot, and this story is is very resonant. It has a the sort of characteristic, the the archetypical characteristics of fairy tales, which is that it, it resonates very deeply, and it leads to two years later. So 1816 is this story about a robot, and then two years later, 1818, Mary Shelley publishes Frankenstein. And there's a lot of interesting parallels between the two in the sense that Frankenstein is, is, a, is extremely powerful where the monster is, is, not, um, is clearly not a human and is frightening, and, but yet has, again, these very emotional interactions, a very, again, whether it's the idea of a sentimental creature or maybe you can think of it as a sentimental machine of its time now i want to fast forward because this is 1818 and we jump 100 years to 1918 and here we have the flu the the pandemic of um of 1918 which is a massive massive world event and i wouldn't have thought of this two years ago i wasn't on my radar as Damoth and I have have discussed, it was there was a there was a large amnesia about this, uh, and and we've been reawakened to this in the course of the last year, uh, because the the symmetry of our current pandemic is, is so fascinating to understand how something like this could could arise, how it could affect so many millions of lives. So I'm just now reconsidering. I've been thinking about the the role of this date and the timing right at the at, at the conclusion of world war or during and, and the conclusion of world war one so 1918 is a very interesting time for 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 thinkers and this book comes out by victor Sigalin that is an essays on exoticism and it's a precursor in many ways to saeed's much later book on orientalism and and it's it's very interesting because it's 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 it takes the idea of orientalism of an exaggeration of the of the positive and negative traits of an imagined other and makes it more universal not just limited to oriental oriental cultures like the middle east and far east which is what saeed writes about but it applies to any other culture if it, it it may be in Native Americans or Aboriginal um, uh, per people, in it, it's a it's a very powerful idea of exoticism that we tend to 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 over dramatize the the positive aspects. We we project a lot of positive elements onto some group or culture that's that's unfamiliar to us 
um, in a way, as it's almost a colonial, it is a colonialist in, in, in instinct that tends to, by doing this projection, is a way of exerting control over these, um, over these other cultures. So this is 1918, two years, a uh, hundred years after after Frankenstein, and during the midst of the pandemic. And this is when Freud publishes the Uncanny, his essay on the Uncanny, Das Unheimlich. And we've talked about this in in past workshops, but it's a recurring and interesting theme, and it's 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 I think so relevant to where we are today, and particularly the timing is so interesting. It's right in the middle of the of the 1918 1919 pandemic so freud must have been very uh, immersed in a, a, a scenario very much like what we are we've experienced in the last year and a half and i'm very curious how others feel about this period i, I know the historians among us and thomas and others will have much more to say on this and, and much more experience or, or knowledge of the of the period but i've been fascinated by what was going on during that time and how did it lead to this sort of explosion in 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 creativity so that's 1919 one year later jpeg publishes the his his play it, it appears on stage rossum's universal robots so just as the close of that pandemic there is a new play um, and the word robot is coined so um so um this leads to a, a, the, the, the century of interest in the concept of ro robots and, and brings us why we're here today. The Fritz Lang um, Metropolis is 1927. Asimov's I, Robot is 1950. Namjoon Pike is in 1960 exploring robot, robots as sculpture. And of course, 1970, Masahiro Mori comes up with the concept of the uncanny valley. And this is a incredible. Tiffany, you must be quiet here. I'm in the middle of a talk. And Masahiro Mori um, presents the, the concept of the uncanny valley. He doesn't name it that at the time, as we've discussed in previous workshops. But the uncanny valley, as everyone here knows, is this conceptual con idea of a dip in 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 reaction to something that is very lifelike but not alive and it is very relevant to the freudian concept of the general emotion of the uncanny that feeling of discomfort when something unfamiliar something sorry familiar feels deeply unfamiliar at the same time so there's this the idea of the representational uncanny is where you have a, a being that looks um, very uh, uh, like human-like, but is not. And I in, in a recently wrote a, an essay with with uh, Elizabeth Jockham on what we call the experiential uncanny, and that is where you have an uncanny experience, but it's not it's not triggered by a, by a physical resemblance to a human, but by an experience. And we use the telegarden as a, a case study there, which is the installation that we developed now 25 years ago, where we people were able to operate a robot over the internet. And the idea of this was, in, in retrospect, I see it as, as very uncanny, the idea of seeing something that, in this case, not, not human-like, but lifelike, or natural, um, namely living plants, but seeing them through this interface of the World Wide Web. And that mediated experience, what, how does that, what, what reactions and what, what does that trigger in, in us in some, in, in, in some ways out has its elements of the uncanny. And I wanna, I wanna end with some um, remarks about a new project that we released just before the pandemic and this is a sequel to the to the telegarden and the we called it the alpha garden now the telegarden was conceived as a, a 
a, a study, a response to the World Wide Web itself and about the idea of, of communication and mediation over distances. And to the, in the sequel, we wanted to do something very different. And in a sense, go back to the subject of a garden, but consider it in the context of what, what I'm fascinated by today, the, the new technology is artificial intelligence. And again, there's a lot of claims about artificial intelligence that I, I, uh, I find exaggerated, um, to put it mildly. And I wanted to do develop a, a project that would, that would explore this and at the same time critique the, the, um, the, the myths around artificial intelligence. So Alpha Garden um, is named consciously in reference to, to the London-based Deep Minds work on AlphaGo and AlphaFold. Their series of, of, of beautiful projects actually around artificial intelligence. And I wanted to project that into the context of a garden. And so we, we started developing this, my students and I, and collaborators, um, and we used a, a commercially available robot system. This is known as the FarmBot. And I wanna give them a plug because it's a wonderful machine. It's actually commercially, um, they, they've sold thousands of these and they're approximately $3,000, but it's a, uh, it's a beautiful design and it, it's, it works extremely well. So it's a, it's a gantry that moves in um, uh, X, Y, and Z directions. And so we have that set up in a greenhouse on campus and we started to consider how the robot could learn to garden. And, in, and I wanna add that it's very important, the context is not to, not to have agriculture in the sense of a very planned, uh, rigid garden, um, monoculture garden, which is what, how farming and agriculture is, is primarily done in the West today, um, but in a polyculture garden. And so we started to develop a, uh, a learning system with cameras overhead, as you can see here. And we, we, we also had to cope with the issue that the, the time constants for plants are very, very long. So if you want to learn, it's going to take the cycle, it would take months to get even a trickle of data. So we developed a simulator that could allow us to simulate plant growth over a longer period of time. And actually, let me go back to this. Uh, here we go. This is a um, the simulator that's basically running at 10,000 times the speed of, of nature. The small, the, you're seeing the growth here and the, the the red triangle, the red squares are uh, pruning elements. So that's where the system, the plants are pruned. And here we can look at 64 gardens and run them in parallel. And we can try out different policies, different pruning strategies to see how they perform. And then we evaluate those gardens in terms of criteria, reward function that, that is based on, on, on coverage and diversity. Anyway, this is one view of the one, one installation of the one um, cycle of the garden. It's one season of the garden growing. As you can see, it somewhat outgrew its uh, its space. And when we 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 launched this in New York in an installation um, uh, by by um, Christian Paul that was um, at the New School, and the. What, what happened was we had the, the system running in the in, in, from Berkeley remotely in New York and the um, it was it was set up and this is showing you the evolution of the of that particular garden but what happened was we which no one expected but the the, the show opened in in February and by March we the pandemic was upon us so we um we had to we were no longer allowed to access the greenhouse and so we but we had the cameras running so what we were able to do is just essentially watch as the as the garden essentially went into its final phase and as you're seeing this here what was so surprising we could not water the garden so it was no longer getting any irrigation and what surprised us was how it started to suddenly send up flowers and these last almost desperate 
attempts to to get attention, which we 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 didn't expect at all. And we just had to essentially every day we would come in and see the garden as it essentially um, deteriorated to the point of um, at the end of April, it was essentially dead. So to me, this was such an interesting um, it was, it was, it reminded me that last image as we watched from a distance of Guernica, because the, the garden was essentially reaching out and desperation looking for a way to survive. So it taught us something and I'll be happy to talk more about this during the Q and A. I'll end by just noting that I think there's something to be learned about this, this in regard to, to our thoughts about the other coming back to the earlier point of, of, of the new thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there's been a lot of fears about immigrants over the past, past two years. And I think that this is very important to address that, that robots and technologies such as AI are also a form of immigrants. And Robert Oliver Morton from The Economist um, put it this way. He said that robots are immigrants, not from another country um, or, or a foreign land, but from the future. And I love this quote because I think it's so profound that, that robots are uh, very much a, a category of, of foreign, foreign beings, foreign cultures to us. So I end on this note. And I'm happy to respond to any questions.